welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Um, today I'm really excited for our guest, um, Dr Lizzie Rogers, who are introduced. So we're going to be talking all things Jane Austen, well, specifically Sanderton. So I am just finished binge watching it a few days ago, the final series. So I'm excited to, um, to dig into it today. So I'll just introduce Lizzie briefly for everyone. So Lizzie's a historian who specialises in women, reading, collecting and historic houses in the 18th and early 19th centuries and a depiction in popular culture. She has a PhD from the University of Hull, which she graduated from in 2020. And Lizzie also um, is a freelance writer, consultant and researcher. She's published for academic and popular presses. Um, some of her recent work has been advising Elle magazine on the real history behind Bridgerton and acting as a consultant to BBC History Revealed on an essential guide to Jane Austen's England. That latter came out in October. And she's also currently working on a a book project exploring links between Jane Austen's fictional representations of the country house with those of real young women in the 18th and early 19th century. And um, I'll share a link at the end for Lizzie's blog as well, where you can find her um, work and contacts. Welcome, Lizzie. Thank you so much for having me, Beth. I'm excited to talk Jane Austen. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> I had so much fun. We were talking about earlier, um, weren't we, before, about our episode with Rita Dashwood a few months ago, talking about women in property and Jane Austen. So it's been a few months. We needed some Jane back on the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we need Jane back. <laughs> exactly. We need Jane back. So Sanderton is just, yeah the perfect um, topic for us to discuss as the third and final series um, yeah. hit ITV just about a month or so ago. So yes, so viewers, just a, a quick spoiler warning that if you were really excited to watch Sanditon Series 3 and you haven't yet, like there are some spoilers here. So just be mindful of that if you're listening in. But, you know, we try not to spoil everything, but there might be, you know, a few things as we go through. So, Lizzie, um, so we're going to um, just introduce kind of where we're at in Sanderton at the start of the final series. So the heroine Charlotte Hayward, she returns to Sanderton. Um, I think this was a cliffhanger at the end of the second season, if I'm right, that she was, is that right, that she was getting engaged? Um, yes. So she. Perfect. So she returns in in this final season um, with this news of an engagement, not to Mr. Colburn, who she had a romantic entanglement with in series two, but to Ralph Starling, a farmer local to her family area um, and home who her father wanted her to marry. But before we get into some detail of the series, what were your general thoughts on the final season and kind of, you know, how your feelings compared to it and um, to the first two series? Well, it's kind of, it's grown into a lot more of an ensemble show, I would say. The first season's very much Charlotte Hayward's the heroine, of course, like any good Jane Austen novel or adaptation, there's several characters who come into play. But it was really all about Charlotte. And I feel like as season two's progressed, as season three's progressed, um, Georgiana's become much more of kind of a co-heroine, Georgiana Lamb. Um, and we get a lot more different storylines. We get a variety of relationships, lots of different ages of characters, which I think is super interesting and great and I mean it's amazing that it began as a 12 chapter fragment an unfinished Austin story and this is what we've got um and we get kind of the growth of seaside resort towns female education um I love the growth of Arthur Parker's character but we'll talk yes. more about him later but <laughs> it, it, it's it's really fun to see a continuation of the Jane Austen story and it's been very exciting to see how they've panned out and the writers actors and kind of creators of the show have played with it especially as Sanderton had such a close connection to uh, Jane Austen fan culture or with Jane Austen fan culture because it was cancelled after the first season mm. and um, kind of fans enthusiasm brought it back which I'm very grateful for because I've lost season two and three. I completely agree 
<laughs> and I think it's um, I think it's mostly fans in America as well, if I'm right, that were particularly to thank with um, you know, with getting the show back and PBS involved with it as well. Yes, I think so. I mean, season one ended on a huge cliffhanger, and we don't. I, I mean, I, I don't like cliffhangers. I like things to be tied up and neatly <laughs> at the end, which I'm very pleased happened in season three. Um, no, they did a great job bringing it back and kind of keeping it alive and keeping it exciting. Definitely. No, I completely agree. And with and it's just kind of testament to the fact that we've got so much to talk about on this episode. It's yes. just like how much happens in the final series oh and gosh, just how so they much. yeah, managed to kind of keep going from the first one, where obviously the um, one of the main characters in the first one, Sydney, Parker didn't return in the second season yes. due to the actor's decision not to return. So, you know, that could have been something that could have really from the show but they really like made an effort to introduce lots of new characters and and kind of keep it fresh yeah definitely I, I mean yeah when I read that um C.O. James wasn't returned I was like oh I wonder what's gonna happen here because they'd spent a whole season building this really interesting relationship between them a very kind of love hate Mr. Darcy Elizabeth Bennett kind of feel I mean who doesn't love that um but they did such a good job of kind of taking elements from kind of the period the history Austin's other novels um and building a kind of whole world um that I think has a very satisfying conclusion definitely and we well, of course with any Austin we've got to talk about um the romantic storylines and about marriage as an you know an ideal or, and then as a kind of a concrete thing that happens in the plots and kind of whether um love is is like a prerequisite for marriage for these characters and um, so Charlotte who we've already mentioned and Georgiana Lamb and um, they particularly grapple with this through the final series so we just wanted to have a little chat with you next kind of about in Georgian and Regency England there were multiple kind of motivations or considerations to, to consider before um, you know actually getting married and yeah what were your kind of your thoughts on that? Yes I mean Marrying for love was becoming increasingly popular, but of course, as as we see on the show, there are a lot of other considerations that come into play. I mean, particularly with Georgiana Lamb. I mean, she inherits, I think, or she's due to inherit, she inherits in the third season, £100,000, which is a huge fortune by their standards. I mean, if you looked at inflation today, it'd be kind of crazy fortune um and of course for her the real um and, and again a real consideration for heiresses um during this period is trying not to marry yourself off to a fortune hunter protecting that fortune and also your interests um one of the richest heiresses in regency history um is a woman called Catherine Tilney Long so she was um known as the Wiltshire heiress and she um wasn't uh, technically meant to inherit her brother died and the money went to her but she inherited um, at the age of about 15 when her brother passed away 23,000 acres of land lots of country houses and around 40,000 pounds a year um, so thinking that's four times what Mr Darcy has in Pride and Prejudice um, so it's a pretty oh. huge fortune and she desperately wanted to marry for love she was kind of courted by um what uh, like dukes um things like you know the kind of highest levels of society because she had all this wealth but she ends up marrying um the duke of wellington's nephew um who has the kind of interesting name mr william wellesley pole and they married for love but he turned out to be kind of the biggest cad known to man uh, mm. to say it politely he tries i have to heard of him oh. yeah <laughs> Yeah, he tries to turn her children against her, but he's super, you know, super excited about all this wealth. He even changes his name and he ends up with a quadruple barrel name, which I hope I've got this in the right order. It's Mr. William Pole Tilney Long Wellesley. I mean, really easy to sign when you're writing that. <laughs> yeah. um, but she, so he kind of really takes advantage of her, you know, and she ends up dying quite young. He's turned her ch their children against her. But actually, in her obituary, she dies in 1825, her obituary in the Observer newspaper even recognises the problem of having so much wealth as an heiress. Um, mm. So it, it, her obituary said, um, with a fortune that made her an object and prize to princes, this amiable woman gave her hand and heart to the man of her choice, and with them all the unbounded wealth could bestow. But to her, riches have been worse than poverty, and her life seems to have been sacrificed and her heart ultimately broken through the very means which should have cherished and maintained her in the happiness and splendour which her fortune and disposition were alike qualified to produce. 
which I think is so sad. And I think that's the situation that Georgiana in the show kind of represents trying to avoid. And, and then, of course, you have the converse of that. So not every woman trying to marry in Georgian England is, of course, a really wealthy heiress. Um, so then you've got the kind of idea of trying to marry to protect a station in society, of getting stability, um, or even kind of gaining some financial stability, most of all. I mean, Jane Austen wrote to her own niece, Fanny Knight, in 1817, that single women have a dreadful propensity for being poor, which is one very strong argument in favour of matrimony. Um, so she was very aware. And of course, she had a very unstable kind of moving around until her brother gave them the living at Chawton because she was unmarried. Um, but also marriage could afford kind of independence as well. Um, so if you married the right person, um, they could give you the the home, the wealth um, that could enable you to pursue your own interests and kind of have a stability you might not have had before. So so much going into choosing the right partner. Um and of course, that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. These are just some of the um, considerations that Austin's heroines had to think about that she's representing. Um, so as I say, marrying for love is getting more and more popular. But of course, there's all of these other kind of financial, emotional, mm. um, other kind of physical issues that need to be taken into account too. Definitely. So many, so many things that they had to think know. about. And like, you know, like with Paul Catherine as well, like making you know the wrong choice isn't something what ended up being wrong choice is not something is easily remedied or in her case you know at all remedied exactly exactly and especially for women who are marrying in as well they had kind of less freedom legally to kind of split away and do things than the men would although I'm pretty sure that um Mr William Wellesley Paul quadruple surname ended up <laughs> Um, everybody hated him uh, you know he was notorious and so he died with a very very bad reputation um, but it is kind of that's one of the worst cases I think mm. um, in Georgian society but it's that that warning to other women who are kind of in that same situation as Georgiana Lamis with such a huge fortune. And we also have in the final season an unexpected engagement, <laughs> yes. which is of, of Lady Denham. And when I was just like, wow, well, okay, this is happening. I, yeah, because <laughs> she's so, um, you know, I don't know, she's just so Lady Denham. I was just yes. like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we meet an old um flame of lady denim in the final series a mr price um and they become engaged and you know quite a fun storyline um but yeah. um spoiler she doesn't turn up on the wedding day yeah. and decides that she can't give up her title her independence her house in sanderton she kind of sees her staff starting to pack up her belongings and it's like a bit like whoa okay maybe i don't want this um <laughs> and yeah. um we mentioned um Rita Dash's episode which is about women and property in in Jane Austen's novels and um this reminded me of that in um Lady Denham's emotional um attachments to her house and her property as well as the kind of you know concrete um other concrete things like her title so I was yeah interested in to hear your thoughts on Lady Denham's storyline there and um and then also the um the interesting unique um position of widows in Georgian society yeah I mean what a storyline I really <laughs> enjoyed this I thought it was so fun but I also thought it was a great move by the show because mo I mean most particularly Austin adaptations are about kind of young women in their you know young 20 something women early 20s um you know falling in love kind of finding their their space in the world and I really liked that in this season, more widely, they really kind of looked at different ages of women in their life cycle. Like, and they're all given relationships. They're all given actual, like, good storylines. They weren't just throwaway storylines. And I love this idea that she has this lost love and this kind of story before. And he kind of sweeps in and he's a bit brash. And um, absolutely love the casting. This is a bit of a tangent, but love the casting of uh, Mr. Price because I remember watching... I think he's in like a 1970s sitcom called whatever happened to the likely lads I hadn't seen it. I used to watch it with my parents when I was little and um it, he like pops up on screen and I'm like wow oh my gosh so it was a great kind of <laughs> comic uh casting of um James Bolan I think his name is um but it, I really love that because 
it also made her seem a bit more human um mm. love I loved on uh Rita Dashwood's podcast um that she was talking about Lady Den and Lady Catherine de Burr and all these propertied women in Austin immensely propertied wealthy women who are pretty much horrible characters and that's all up until probably towards the end of season two when you know Lady Denham really shows heart towards her niece Esther who's going through fertility struggles and she's desperate to have a baby we don't really see any heart from her she's very kind of cut off from everybody loves to do her own thing so I kind of love this light-hearted romantic storyline but it also revealed this I mean, this freedom that wealthy widows have and her trying to grapple with what that means for her um so in kind of Georgian Regency England uh widows who had wealth actually did have this kind of level of freedom and one such kind of famous wealthy widow was Elizabeth Montagu who was one of the founders of the Blue Stockings she was known as Queen of the Blues um and she had married Edward Montagu who was a grandson of the first Earl of Sandwich they'd married in 1742 and he was almost three decades older than her I think she was 22 he was about 50 so there's an immense age gap Mm. there um which uh, wasn't terribly unusual um for that period um but she ended up kind of using this marriage her knowledge the the wealth I mean he had a lot of wealth in coal mining and land in the north of England and she was actually very adept at managing it particularly after he passed away so he passed away in 1775 by this point she'd helped co-found the blue stockings her house in London had become the salon to attend. David Garrick went there, Joshua Reynolds, uh, Samuel Johnson. Of course, all the other blue stockings were there. Um, so she was pretty famous and pretty kind of amazing. And um, well, that's a point of opinion from me. I love Elizabeth Montague. Um, but when when he died, she had about £7,000 income a year. Again, uh, somewhere between kind of for an Austin reference between Mr Bingley's 5,000 and Mr Darcy's 10 so she's pretty wealthy and she managed it really well and it meant she could basically do whatever she wanted she played this important role in society she had these intellectual groups um she was a Shakespeare critic she did all of these kind of really cool things and she carved it through this kind of position in hierarchy through her marriage through conserving her widowhood um which I think is a really great example of although Lady Denham isn't presiding over a salon um, or at, like a great social circle in the same way, it's that idea of what you could build and keep if you were a widow, um, which I think is pretty illustrative there. Definitely. And we kind of see from the first season that Lady Denham has played such a big role in the in you know in like the creation of Sanditon as yes. a as a resort as a holiday yes. place you know as well as home for the local community and her having her home so for her to actually just leave all of that we kind of understand why that yes. was such a big decision for her exactly i mean she's a huge investor in Sanditon because she has all this wealth that i think she gained through two husbands or she does I uh, re- recently reread the like little 12 chapter fragment and I think she she gained this wealth and the title through her two different husbands and um, so yeah she chooses to channel it into this new business venture which is actually very forward thinking um, for somebody who seems so stuck in her ways and I mean they even dress her in slightly older fashioned clothes um, I don't know if you've noticed that she's almost got more 18th century like the kind of corsety dresses um, to yes use it um, rather than the empire line, um, kind of more modern for the uh, kind of 18 teens, 1820s. Um, so she's actually pretty forward thinking for somebody who seems very stuck in her ways when you think about it like that. Now, it's really interesting about the costume because it's not something that um, that you necessarily pick up as you're watching it. But yeah. just you mentioning it there, I was like, oh, wait, yeah, that's so true. I, I only really noticed it after um, watching... Bridgerton because oh, um, of course yeah. Queen Charlotte I mean not in Queen Charlotte Bridgerton story because that's set more it's that earlier but in the Bridgerton TV show uh, Queen Charlotte wears older fashion clothes and she did that in real life that that's something that she did and and you know I think it's a really interesting kind of contrast to show somebody who's older and a little bit more set in their ways and things um yeah I I, I mean it, that's the fascinating thing about period drama is all the elements mm. that come together to make storytelling 
No, definitely. That's a, yeah, really interesting to think about kind of the way those decisions are made. And we were also, um, we've also mentioned earlier the, the single woman in, in various kind of guises in, um, in these adaptations. Um, and there's some, yeah, some really interesting examples of that in, in Sanderton. Um, so we have, for example, one of the new characters, Lydia, daughter of Lady Montrose, whose mother is very, very desperate to see her married. And we have lots of great comic scenes between the yes. two of them, <laughs> um, which I'm sure we could get into. And also um, returning character um, Beatrice Hankins, sister of the local reverend, and she forms an attachment with Dr. Fuchs. And yeah, I was interested to kind of dig into these storylines because I think it also, in um, Beatrice's case, goes into your point earlier about the um, the age range in, in yes. Sanderton where it's not just like a 20-something-year-old woman having a romantic storyline. You know, it's, it's so much broader than that. Yeah, I think that was just something that really struck me while I was watching is that there's all these and not only women at different ages, but women at different positions of society. I mean, you even have um, Lady de Clermont, um, who is Charlotte's friend, who is basically uh, was widowed at 30. Um, she ends up being um, a mistress of the, pr the Prince Regent, as he still is at this point in the show, I believe. Or is it, I, I can't remember, is he, I can't, I think he's still the Prince Regent, or is he the King? I think it's like, I can't remember what episode it is of this season, yeah. but I think it's, he's just become the King in, in one of the okay. episodes, yeah. yeah. Yes, um, yeah, because I was thinking there's that bit where they say that he's coming and he doesn't come in the end. Yeah. It's like a big, a big slight towards her because she was his favourite, so to speak. And again, she kind of, without spoiling too much, tries to find love again. It's all these different kind of positions in society and I loved Lydia Montrose and her overbearing mother, who, as you say, is desperate to get her married. Um, she's And she's almost, you almost fall into thinking of her as kind of an Anne Elliot from Persuasion style character because mm. she mentions that she, she loves somebody, but her mother didn't think he was good enough. And then it turns out that she's still in touch with him. Um, but she's a lot kind of, she's a lot more sarcastic. She's a lot funnier. Um, you know, not that I, I think Anne Elliot's a great character, but she's just she's quite different. They're not trying mm -hmm. to take Austin characters and repopulate Sanditon with them all. Um, and this kind of interesting relationship she has with her parent, who's just desperate to see her married off. I think it's it is it's comical, um, but you can see the frustration um, that she's constantly being told she's old when she's probably at most in her late twenties. And it's really interesting to think, of, like you say, about this this single woman. Um, and with Beatrice Hankins, I love the storyline there with Dr. Fuchs. I thought it was so sweet. Um, it was. But I also, yeah, it was just really, really nice, um, like a really sweet storyline. But I like the way they explored her, like trying to come out from her brother's shadow. Because so Reverend Hankins is kind of a bit of a fire and brimstone vicar um very very serious um he's only briefly mentioned in the kind of sanditon that jane austen left behind but i think the kind of creators of the show have very much gone off austen's models of clergymen which are normally kind of quite comical characters um he very much kind of gave me reverend elton and emma kind of vibes but a little bit older um and he's kind of quite controlling of her, especially when he notices that her and Dr. Fuchs kind of have this uh, chemistry, so to speak. But I think what's really lovely about their relationship is it's built on some of her interests. So outside of the church and being a part of the church community. So um, her interest in speaking German and learning a language, her interest in kind of uh, medical research and things like that. They kind of correspond about it. Um, and also ultimately, the kind of she's allowed she's allowed to experience womanhood and femininity and falling in love outside of kind of the role that her brother's really assigned to her which I think is really really nice to see in a character that isn't super young again um yeah I think they did a really good job without it seeming like they were trying to neatly tie up every every storyline I think they did a really great job of exploring a variety of different relationships in the show and kind of giving the, and they're not necessarily super easy storylines for a lot of the women, but giving them all kind of the things they deserve to end the show. Definitely.
No, I completely agree with that. Um, and we've got to go back to Georgiana, because as you said, yes. she had such an interesting journey in the show where, you know, she was just kind of one of the characters, you know, Charlotte was a losing lady, but then we've seen, and I think fans really, a lot of fans really wanted a bigger role for Georgiana. Yes. And, you know, we we got that, like we got some really big um, developments in, in her storyline. Um, and I mean, in, in season three, she just has you know such a time of it um for a couple of the episodes um so she's brought to trial by um charles lockhart who um listeners if they've seen series two they will remember him and um, the artist um who she had a kind of yeah. you know potential love affair with and then you know we found out his motives were um were less than good um, <laughs> um yep <laughs> and so um in the final series he is I think suing her, if that's the right term, to yes. try and um, to take her inheritance, um, which she got from her father. And he's just trying to cast all these aspersions onto her character and her relationship with her father and basically say, you know, it's all false. Like, she just wants his money. They didn't really have a relationship. Like, all of this rubbish that he yeah. throws. And, you know, that's that's a really big ordeal for her that she she actually has to go to court and defend herself she's quite reluctant to at the beginning and yeah this is a really big storyline and then she also has a lot else going on in the season like um, we've spoken about the the so-called fortune hunters like Charles Lockhart <laughs> I mean yeah what did you make of everything that was just happening to Georgiana in that season I mean Georgiana goes through such a kind of crazy set of events that happened to her from being brought to standard term because Sydney Parker's um, her legal guardian when her father passes away to then this whole thing of being literally pursued by several fortune hunters. And in season two, I think she, I mean, she's always been a character who's really known her own voice, which I think has been really amazing from in season one, kind of ridiculing Lady Denham at a dinner party when Lady Denham shows kind of racial ignorance when she like, puts a pineapple on the table and starts kind of being really condescending to her about her race um she's somebody who really knows her own voice and I think that's kind of increased um as the seasons have gone on I mean in season two she her she does the sugar boycott um and that's alluded to again in season three um so she kind of finds uh her voice really really publicly and then season three um we have this kind of concurrent storyline of the court case with Charles Lockhart basically because he's a white man trying to take the fortune away from her as a black woman um then finding out her mother's still alive I believe that's a cliffhanger at the end of season two I think and then season three she's kind of like oh where is she um and in the court case they tell all these lies about her mother to kind of cast aspersions on where, where Georgiana came from um which is so sad to watch um and but I mean she's ultimately successful but I think she then decides that she'll almost go through with a sham marriage to try and protect herself because of what she's been through um and again without doing too many spoilers that doesn't happen but it you know it shows kind of the reliance she has on her friends around her and that she feels quite alone in the world so then to, for a big part of the storyline to be the fact that she finds her mother um is so wonderful I think so I think Georgiana has this immense period of growth but she's also I think it's a really interesting gateway into thinking about being a woman of color in Georgian society and kind of early 19th century society and there was around 20,000 black people living in England at the time mostly concentrated around cities but also scattered across the country so very much present in British society at the time. Um, and I read some really interesting research recently by Montaz Marche, who has been looking at um, black women in British society around this time. Um, and Marche's research uh, really looks at Christian burial records, um, showing that around 20 black women from the Caribbean became married heiresses in Britain, which I think is super interesting. But also crucially that um, for women of colour in society at this time, they had to assimilate rather than integrate um, with Marsha describing them uh, black women as social chameleons because of the large unacceptance of black um, cultural practices. So I think it's really interesting then looking at this um, at a black heiress in Sanditon because I think perhaps the most famous kind of um, real history equivalent character is perhaps Dido Elizabeth Bell at Kenwood House. I mean, 
uh, Dido uh, Bell has had a, a movie made about her too, um, which kind of plays with the truth a little bit, but it's such a great, interesting um, story. And she's the daughter of Sir, um, Sir John Lindsay and the formerly enslaved Maria Bell. Um, and she grew up at Kenwood House, just outside of London, um, overlooking Hampstead Heath, um, with as the ward of her father's uncle. And he was the first Earl of Mansfield who actually ruled in significant cases about slavery and its legality um, in Britain and kind of Britain's trade abroad. Um, and she, we believe that she was brought up as a lady alongside her cousin, Elizabeth Murray. But what I think is really interesting is that when the Ellen Mansfield passes away, he's her guardian, um, she kind of lives the rest of her life in a comfortable but middling status. Um, she does not have the fortune to rely on that Georgiana Lamb does. Um, and actually, she was given less money than her cousin Elizabeth. But whether that's to do with illegitimacy or race, um, people aren't sure. But she marries a steward, um, so kind of like an estate manager called John de Vinier. Um, so very different, really, um, to Georgiana's position. But interesting to also think about um, is kind of having that same kind of luxury um, around her, but also having this kind of jarring status and people looking at her in the same way that Georgiana's experienced. And I really liked the fact that Georgiana got to marry somebody she actually truly loved, but the reason she was kind of thrown back into their path was because of this relationship with her mother, which I think for her to find a family and kind of acceptance was what she really, really wanted. Um, so, yeah, she's become a great heroine. And actually the a actor who plays her, Crystal Clark, said that um, she would only come back after season one if um, Georgiana was given such a, a great role. And actually she, um, Clark, has kind of influenced some of the storylines and the, the creators of the show have been really open to that, which I think is great. Um, it's a really kind of interesting portrayal on TV. No, that's so important, and um, the fact that Crystal Clark was, you know, was able to, yes. you know, to 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 help make those make that change happen is, um, yeah, is brilliant because Georgiana is such a wonderful character that, yes. yeah, I'm really pleased that you know that that Clark was able to to voice that and to kind of um get those storylines in motion because yeah, she's fantastic. Yes, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about women before we go on to some masculine representations as well. So one of the other things I wanted to discuss was a bit more on women's agency and education in this period. So we have um another comic kind of couple and character um Tom Parker and his wife Mary. She she kind of tries to have more of a voice in this series and um she really wants to kind of have some some new ideas for Sanderton and um, ways to help the poor residents. And Tom gets embroiled in this scheme with Mr. Price for some fancy hotel or something. And it's like, yep, we're just going to have to knock down all the residents' houses. And Mary's like, um, can we not? <laughs> so yes. there's some interesting stuff going on there. And Tom is very, very dismissive of Mary and her ideas. And it's basically just like, you know, you deal with the house, I will deal with this hotel business. Like, he's just very, very dismissive of her. And then also um, on agency and education, those kind of themes, we also have Charlotte, um, you know, is clearly very learned and has other plans besides marriage in her future, she hopes. And yeah, what were your thoughts on, on some of those representations? I think that was super interesting, especially because Mary's basically fighting gentrification, which is super interesting So I think, that's something that we're constantly fighting today, um, this idea of gentrification. Um, but Tom basically, in no uncertain terms, tells her to get back in her box effectively and is very kind of strictly gendered in how he looks at their roles. Like he's the entrepreneur. He's the one with the big idea. She supports him and she looks after the house because she's a woman. And he gets especially angry after she's got these wonderful plans that she's drawn up because she actually spends time with the people living in these cottages, like the poorer members of Sanderton society. She takes them to um, Alexander Coleman. Um, he's really interested in what she says. And then Tom finds out and he gets really mad at her for interfering. Um, and, you know, he's constantly cutting back her agency, even though she has this, these amazing ideas. Um, and, you know, he sees himself as like this dreamer and eventually kind of they resolve it. But She's such a voice of reason um, mm. in this season, and and like her voice becomes louder and louder, which I think is really, really great. Um, particularly because um, I think it's it's interesting to see like a representation of um, kind of the 
for a strata of society because we don't often get that in Austin um, adaptations. And if I'm right, I'm pretty sure that they talk about that the cottages they want to tear down are actually lived in by people who helped build Sanderton. Um, that some of the workers who worked on building Tom's vision and they just want to displace them. So I think it's really interesting and I really like the fact that the women took up the cause for this in the show and that Mary in particular as a mother and as somebody who sympathises and has friends who live there um, really took it up. Um, and yeah, it's super interesting as this kind of 200 year old presentation of fighting gentrification. Um, and also to think about Charlotte. So after Sydney's death, she decides to become a governess in season two, and she's very well read. I mean, at the beginning of season three, she brings her fiance Ralph back to Sanderton, and he's visibly embarrassed when he doesn't get a John Keats reference. Um, and Charlotte is uncomfortable that he doesn't really understand that she loves poetry. Like you can kind of see that they're quite ill suited. I mean, he he's very nice, but they're quite ill suited. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost like this push and pull between the old and new. I mean, he's the farmer from where she grew up. And Sanderton's kind of this new place where uh, in the first season, she's like, uh, you know, in complete wonder by it and all the things that are happening there. Um, and now she's become a part of it. And it's this push and pull between home and the the adult version of her almost. And, and it's really interesting thinking about schooling and the women learning and kind of their ideas. I mean, Jane Austen herself only had about two years of formal schooling. And actually during this period and throughout history as a whole, but in the 18th and early 19th century, you've got the Enlightenment happening, uh, which is kind of a movement in thought. And in particular, women's education was talked about a lot um, with a lot of debates about female schooling, what they should learn, what they could learn, who should uh, kind of uh, be in control of that. Um, and we, many traditionally believed that female education was merely an accomplishment to attract a husband or to be a good mother and basically uh, educate sons or their daughters to again become good mothers and wives. Um, and then you've got writers such as Mary Astor, Mary Wollstonecraft, and many others arguing that women shouldn't purely learn for learning's sake, um, but should know and understand their full potential. And we see lots of glimpses of that in Charlotte um, in, in how she interacts with um, Augusta Markham and Leo Colburn, who were kind of her two charges as a governess. Um, and she's trying to teach things that will actually be interesting to them not just needlework and things like that um so I think it's really interesting this kind of idea about education women have an agency but also not purely conforming to the expectations of their class and what should be expected of them because of their gender definitely um and we're gonna um talk about some of the male characters for a yeah. moment but I just have to say first with Tom Parker that you know he's so chaotic throughout yes. all three seasons he is just <laughs> chaotic and the fact that he sees you know I know he, like you said he sees himself as the dreamer but he also yeah. sees himself as this like you know serious entrepreneur and yeah. it's just like Tom like I know have, yeah. he has like, no idea about money mainly um, Mary has to sort it yeah. out like he's kind of he's got like a little bit of a problem for gambling and Mary has yeah. to kind of go in and do the sums and work it out for him you know she's his true backbone really exactly she is yeah like I think that's definitely it that he really um just cannot see quite how yeah. much of an influence she has on him and 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 his work life as well as their family life where if it wasn't for Mary sometimes you're just like he would he and his schemes would just fall apart like yeah he's just yeah. chaotic yeah he <laughs> um, is <so> chaotic. <laughs> he's yeah which is fun for us like you know we yes, like to I'll watch it me. but he's he's just yeah he's something else <laughs> um so um We've got Tom, but we've got some other really interesting male characters as well. And so much happens in this season. So we have um, the kind of beginnings of a redemption arc for um, Edward Denham, who's the biggest yes. rogue. And then we've had various kind of love matches for, I wrote his name wrong. Yes, Alexander Colburn and his brother <laughs> Samuel. I just saw Edward written again. I was like, what? Who's that? Um, and then <laughs> his brother Samuel. Um, and then the aforementioned Arthur Parker. We yeah. um, we loved his storyline um, where we love, he formed, we love Arthur. We do. <laughs> where he formed an attachment to um, Lord Harry Montrose. So that's the son of the <laughs> previously mentioned Lady yeah. Montrose, <laughs> who's very desperate to see her daughter married. So yeah, yeah. what did you think of the um, the very Varying kind of representations of um, of masculinity in the series. 
I mean, there's so much to unpack, particularly in this series. I mean, um, there's, I think they've paid attention, um, the creators of the show, really to audience wants. I think in particular, I mean, Bridgerton season one and two was really kind of lambasted because of its lack of queer visibility. And I think in season three, here we get a, a lovely queer romance um, between Arthur and Lord Harry Montrose. And I was so pleased with this because I love Arthur Park. He's great. Um, and it really follows kind of historical precedent, you know, and there's some really great work being doing, uh, being done, sorry, on queer history in this period at the moment, particularly uh, Dr. Anthony Delaney's working on a new book called Queer Georgians. And I'll, I'll start with Arthur because he is my favourite. Um, I mean, his art through the three seasons, I mean, he starts as kind of this lovable buffoon who's a real hypochondriac. Um, and he's almost like an overgrown child. And I don't mean that in a in a, in a horrible way. I mean, like kind of in his enthusiasm and his uh, kind of way of kind of almost bumbling through life. And then he really comes into his own. He's a caring and loyal friend. He's particularly to Georgiana. Um, they become almost like a little twosome in a way. And at one point she even says to him, oh, I wish I could marry you. And he's like, oh, marriage isn't for me. And as we later kind of find out, um, it's because, you know, he it, because he's gay and he, you know, he can't see himself ever finding happiness uh, that way. Um, and he becomes a real creative mind as well, who really helps with the building of Sanderton against his chaotic brother Tom. <laughs> he almost serves as like an in-between between Tom and Mary, which mm. is something you probably would have never expected of him at the beginning. Um, and I think his queer romance with Lord Harry Montrose was really beautifully written and this idea that they talk about going to live in a cottage the two of them or there's like a really heartbreaking moment where Harry Montrose says and Georgiana decide to marry as a sham to kind of protect both of them and Georgiana floats with Arthur because she kind of has had this romance between Harry and Arthur alluded to her that he could come live with them and Arthur's in, almost insulted by this because he's like well I'm not going to you know hide away and kind of be this afterthought um and I really like the way he advocated for himself in that and he's kind of become a really special important character I think um he really looks out for his friends so I'm glad that he got this happy ending that I also think is quite representative of what went on in Georgian Britain um think about Edward Denham I mean Jack Fox plays him so brilliantly because he's behaved abominably he's like Mr Wickham and Mr Willoughby put together times 10 he he's awful I, I you know and I, I but the, the way he played him I actually felt sad for him in this season <laughs> when because he he seems to fall in love with Augusta Markham and um and I'm so glad though that she didn't become this trope of reforming the bad boy that you see often in in romance which is kind of fun but I think when you think of his backstory in season one and two and particularly in season two when he's manipulating Clara Brereton who he's had a baby with and not married her and also um his uh, is she Esther's his stepsister isn't she um Esther Babington um that he's kind of is literally manipulating her by drugging her so he can send her off to an asylum I mean it's it's a crazy redemption arc in season three but I like the fact that he doesn't you know Augusta doesn't end up with him because he doesn't he doesn't deserve her Completely but it's super agree. interesting yeah it's super interesting to see her kind of fall in love and her actually have a lasting impact on him but it doesn't impact her for the rest of her life I know we're talking about characters but um I, I was like really conflicted about it and as I thought more and more I'm like no he you know he's he's reformed like he's realized that he does have true feelings like that all the things he did were wrong and he actually really looked out for Lady Denham as well um, during this season when previously he just, literally just wanted her fortune um, so I think they wrote it really well but I'm really glad at the way it panned out um, particularly because I think and I think Austin would have liked it too I mean she liked her Kaddish men to get their just desserts and he definitely did <laughs> <laughs> definitely and honestly, we could we could talk for so long. Um, oh we could. <laughs> I'm gonna read just like just so much good stuff in this final season to talk about. But we we have to just have one last question. Um, but we shall. Yeah, definitely gonna have to come back and do some more Jane Austen another time. Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> just so good. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
But um, to kind of round off our discussion on um, on Sanderton today, I mean, as you mentioned, the actual Jane Austen Sanderton is the 12 chapters. That's it. Yeah. It's unfinished. We we have no idea what Austen intended. Yeah. We just don't know like what what if it's in any way comparable, what the kind of show tried to do. You know, we just have no idea how she would have liked things to end for Charlotte or any of the other characters. But I mean, so so we can't, yeah, we can't kind of say what she may have done. But in terms of Sanderton, the TV series, I mean, what did you, I mean, we kind of um, alluded to it earlier that it rounded things off nicely. But it was there more you wanted to say about what you felt of the ending and also um, any kind of resonances, um, obviously, with, with other Austin works in, in the way they concluded? Yeah, I mean... I think it's fascinating that um that them trying to second guess what Austin would have wanted or what her kind of direction would have been. And I, I think it was kind of a masterful thing to do to pick an unfinished work rather than kind of um re uh, adapting a, a previous work because I can't believe I'm saying this as a diehard Jane Austen fan, but I think there have been so many adaptations of her work and it'd be interesting to see some adaptations of other contemporary novels. Um, but I really like that they chose to do this with Sanderton and I, I love the ending and I love that some of the modern outlooks that have been translated in the history kind of chosen to be represented on screen such as Charlotte kind of ending it by having it all where she gets the happy ending the almost fairy tale ending but she also gets her school um, and you know it, it, she's a character invented for a series, but for a married woman to run a school was very, very rare. It tends to be a single woman, but of course it's this fiction. Um, you know, it's a really lovely way to end her storyline and not completely impossible. Um, and the neat ending of the romantic partnerships and the prominence given to characters like Georgiana and Arthur Parker, who were written about with quite a lot of reverence in the remaining fragment, but we don't know where their storylines go. So it's really nice to see kind of all this attention paid to their happy endings. Um, and I think we can definitely see hallmarks of Austen's other novels in um, some of the characters. I think I've alluded to some, but I mean, it's hard not to think of Mr. Wickham and Lydia Bennett when Edward Denham is trying to take away Augusta Markham, even though Augusta's character is very different to Lydia. She's not this kind of flirtatious, naive child. Um, and in season two, I couldn't help but think that Charlotte's love triangle with Alexander Colburn and Colonel Lennox was very much Mr. Darcy, Mr. Wickham, especially with the storyline about kind of they've got this whole backstory between the two of them. It was so Mr. Darcy and Mr. Wickham, but kind of represented not in a way that, you know, we felt like, oh, yeah, we see how this goes, but in just in a really kind of nice reverential way. And Lady Denham's like a more enterprising Catherine de Burr, which I, I really enjoy. I mean, Lady Catherine de Burr, I swear, is the character that everybody loves to hate because she's so entertaining for how she is. Um, but I think the key aspect is that themes of Austin's writing come across in this adaptation with the writers and the makers and the actors and what they've chosen to represent. I mean, Austin primarily wrote about relationships, kind of daily life, and included social satire and humour to make sense of these things and represent the world she lived in. And Sanderton is about marriage, it's about relationships, family, love, and the world that would have been around Austin at the time, a world that was incredibly connected to the West Indies, to war, to women's rights and position in society. And it's really trying to make sense of all these things in a really wonderful, wonderfully written way. I mean, I'm probably pretty biased because I really, really enjoyed it, but I thought they did a really great job in um, taking some of the things that are kind of dropped into those first 12 chapters that are really almost, I don't want to use the word revolutionary, but really kind of different and really kind of delve into the different aspects of history at that time and really kind of going with it and seeing what they could do with the story. Um, so yeah, I think I think they did a great job. I'm, I'm sad there won't be any more seasons, um, but I'm sure there will be another Regency adaptation <laughs> that we can sink our teeth into <laughs> another time. <laughs> Definitely. There, there's always going to be, there's always going to be more, isn't there? More Regency, more yes. Georgian, like we're, we're going to have yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the perfect, mm. perfect place for us to round off our chat um, on Sanderton today. Thank you so much, Lizzie, for joining us. It's been oh, thank um, you, just Beth. a joy. Thank you for having it's me. Been, it's a pleasure. It's, it's been, been so fun. fun.
<laughs> we will definitely um yeah have to come back again um for a chat about something else and definitely. i did mention <laughs> i did mention we were just gonna um give out your your website as well so if anyone wants oh, to go and look at your blogs and um, look up more about your work your website is um, historylizzy.com so do go and check um lizzie's site out everyone and i'm sure follow on social media as well and for yeah for more austin and um 18th century content <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much Thanks, lizzie Sarah. it's been great thank you thank you our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book this is just a small taster as a result we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book. Well, I can edit the end, it's fine. <laughs> Chris, are you there? <laughs> Stop recording.